Hey, this is Mike from Real Black TV, and I just want to take a, a couple of seconds to just make a special introduction to this specific episode of our In Conversation series. Our guest on this episode is Jordu Shell, who is not only you know one one of the preeminent creature designers, conceptual artists in Hollywood today, but he's also a good friend of mine. He's the one person in this world that I've known and maintained a relationship with for the absolute longest and um, during a recent visit about a month ago to Philadelphia we had a chance to sit down and talk I think the conversation is really interesting interesting to me I'd be very curious to see uh, what you think uh, if you enjoy us talking I think we get into some really interesting uh, discussions and about art creativity blackness and uh, whether we need to have our own. If you're not aware, uh, Jordu is working on his very first film called Remote Viewing. And right now, as we post this, he's in the midst of an Indiegogo campaign in order to raise the money to make the film. So if you're a fan of his creature effects and all that stuff, uh, now's a chance for you to help facilitate his vision of what uh, a true horror film should be. So he's written and directed, and he's going to direct this film. And uh, you can go right now to Indiegogo uh, for remote viewing to uh, support that. So without further ado, uh, our conversation with uh, master sculptor, conceptual artist, Jordi Shell. How boring is this to you guys to listen to these two old fucks? <laughs> Talk about their dumb memories. Well, people. No, I think you had a VCR then in '82. I swear to God. All right, keep I it got mugged. <laughs> keep it entertaining. Well, you know. So anyway, um, somebody will watch this and be thumbs down. You, you, you just venture rage in the comment section. This is good. Don't vent your rage. No, YouTube is not for hating. Uh yeah, maybe I, maybe I'd be so. So we're going back to old technology. So I guess the bottom line is, um, you know, it was a game changer for me because I suddenly, you know, I had access to tens of thousands of films I, I could just read about and watch and stuff. I mean, I don't even know what it would be like now if I were like 13 years old. Oh, now every, like millions of things are available to me. To well, I mean, so. part of part of what is so sad, I mean, part of, it's a very, very double-edged sword. On the one hand, you can see anything you want and get anything you want any time of the day, all the time, which is magic. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. You can find old things you wanted. And if I looked right now on eBay, I could probably find one of those laser discs of the howling if I wanted to. Mm -hmm. But on the downside, you can get anything you want, any time you want, any time of the day. Mm -hmm. And there's something that steals the magic from, you know, I mean, I mean, Yes, there are things that are simply gone mm -hmm. in, into the to the winds of time. You know, we'll never see them again or have them again. Um, but because everything is so available now, there is no anticipation. There's no magic. There's no yearning. Um, and and in fact, there's probably less need for nostalgia. And I think nostalgia is such a powerful and bittersweet feeling, you know, mm -hmm. and it's something I'm, I really like that. I, I'm very nostalgic, mm -hmm. very nostalgic. And I, um, I don't know. There's something I think that robs kids this in this era of that kind of magic. The fact that they can see anything they want, whenever they want. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, you don't, you don't have to get your dad to write a note for you to see some R rated. It's right there. <laughs> You know. I mean that. Yes, but I mean, moreover, it, it's like there's no there's no sense of um, uh, I, I don't really know how to put it. There's there's no sense of 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 having to work for anything or or reach for anything or or even learn things by trial and error. You know, you just go on YouTube and find some tutorial for. Whatever the hell you want to do, or mm -hmm. you know, you want to download End of Days with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Why you'd want to, I don't know, but you know what I mean. It's like anything, just, anything you can think of, literally, is 
available at your fingertips to you at, at a touch of a button. Yeah, and if and so, if, you, if you have a retro desire, go on eBay. You'll find your evil can evil. So so I mean, one of these things, part of the conversations we have are with artists, and and um, you know we discuss craft. So one of, one of the questions I always ask is like, all right, so you you've been doing this for how long? How long have you been uh, making creatures professionally? <sighs> Thirty years. Okay, so at what point do you, did you feel that you were really, really good at it? No, oh, there are always people that are better than me. There are a lot of artists that I look at and I'm just in awe of. And, uh, you know, and now with the advent of the internet, I'm meeting people from all over the world that are just incredible. Aris Kalakantis from Greece, Sebastian Lockman from Germany, you know, let alone the guys I know in LA. I mean, there's so many incredible sculptors and artists that humble me. I mean, make me feel mm -hmm. like I thought I was a big fish in a little pond. I'm just a fucking jerk off. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I don't think there's ever a point where you go like, I've mastered this. There, there, there is a point that I've gotten to where I'm feeling more kind of complacent about it. I don't have the same kind of fire and hunger mm -hmm. to achieve in that realm as I did when I was in my 20s. Right, but I mean, like, what impressed me? Like, I've I'd never really seen you work. I've been to your studio and I've seen the work finished. But when you did that show, uh, making monsters, and you're doing the sculpt offs and things like that, I was like, wow, you know, like you're really your your facility to like conceive things and and articulate them to me is incredible. I don't I don't know how you feel well, about thanks. it. Thanks. I mean, I don't know. I, I I think though that that's kind of a commonality with a lot of artists. I'm. One of the pluses I have is that I'm unusually fast. You know, I can I can sculpt something very quickly, but quick doesn't necessarily mean good. You know, it's a matter of being quick and good that makes you you know interesting. But you know, what what you're seeing you know is, is something that I think is is pretty uh, common among artists. You know, my I have a friend named Norman Cabrera and. He comes over and sculpts some time, hang out with me to, to, to at my studio. To He works on Walking Dead. Mm -hmm. But he, he comes over and, you know, just to hang out on the weekend sometime and sculpt a, a, mm -hmm. a Halloween mask or something. And, I mean, he's just like me. He just blasts it out, fury and fire, and just argh, and gets mm -hmm. in there. And he's just this masterpiece, you know. The guy's fucking great. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and you know, and, and, and he and I share the same kind of, passion for the 70s and the 60s and the 80s and old monster movies and shit like that and so he i mean he and i are very similar in that respect um but there are a lot of artists that are capable of just sort of blasting stuff out from the heart you know and, and norman leaps immediately to mind because mm -hmm. uh he's one of my favorite artists out there and uh well so i mean for those so I think, but there's some commonalities between what you do and what I do as as a filmmaker or whatever. Um, I mean, what generally, what's your creative process? I mean, you know, if you're if you're not doing something for hire and you just, just for want myself, to do something, yeah. Well, usually, you know, I I have an, a, a flash of an idea, or or I see something in nature, or in an old painting, or or another artist has done something that inspires me. You know, and I get this kind of flash of something that could be mm -hmm. and something I'd like to see in front of me in three dimensions, something I, I would like to own, mm -hmm. something I wish was already out there for sale. Mm -hmm. And um, if, if, if I'm in the middle of too many projects, I'll put it on a list of, of things I want to make. You know, mm -hmm. ooh, I've got this great idea for this goblin with these little wings or something, you know, like that. Mm -hmm. And... Then, uh, you know, when I've got some downtime and I feel like relaxing, I open that list and there are all these different creature and bizarre art ideas. And I'll just choose one off the list that I feel connected to at the moment and I'll do it. Mm -hmm. Wait, and it's like an iPad? It's electronic or is it handwritten? Yeah, no, it's, 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 on, my, it's on my computer. Okay. You know, it's just a, a, a Word file. So then, I mean, well, talk us through like a, a for hire thing, like Avatar. How did that happen for you, and and what was the collaborative process like? Um, well, first of all, there is no one on Earth who can really take credit for the designs in Av Avatar, other than James Cameron. They were, they were really all of his ideas, mm -hmm. and we were all just there to be hands to kind of 
flesh it out and and bring some sense of our own mm-hmm. stylist stylings to it. But it was it was really his thing. Um, mm-hmm. But he, there was an open call for portfolios for creature design portfolios. So tons of artists submitted. Only three or four artists, four artists, including myself, were chosen. Wow. Okay. So you're like, wow, it's not really that big a deal. Um, but it was exciting because I'd never worked with him. Um, and one of them uh, was Wayne Barlow, who is a famous creature designer who did Barlow's Guide to Extraterrestrials. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've ever heard of that book, um, but it's a book full of his art. Anyway, um, so myself and, 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 and Wayne and two other guys just started off uh, working at Jim's Malibu home, mm-hmm. just doing drawings in the kitchen. It was crazy. And um, so he kind of come to you with an idea. Had you read the script or like, well, what? at first it was a little free form. We were just kind of just going off and just kind of flights of fancy and doing mm-hmm. all kinds of weird stuff. And um, I left the production for a little while. Um, you know, I was very frustrated because Jim didn't want any sculptures. Mm-hmm. He, he only wanted to see um, drawings. And so I was doing drawings, but I just, my heart just wasn't in it. I really felt like I could breathe life into these things if I got a chance to put them into clay because that's really the best way I work. Mm-hmm. So I left the production for a couple months and was just like, this just isn't for me. Mm-hmm. Well, then I got a call back and, you know, not too long after. And uh, Jim personally wanted me to come back because mm-hmm. he wanted me to sculpt some stuff. I was like, okay, great. Mm-hmm. And then I spent the next two years in the film just sculpting oh. and doing maquette after maquette. Maquettes are miniatures, um, miniature sculptures. And uh, those maquettes were then scanned mm-hmm. in the computer. Um, and, and basically I ended up designing all those anatomies of, of those, mm-hmm. of the Navi creatures. So, mm. Well, that, that's interesting. I mean, cause you, you still work in a very, um, tangible format, an old world format. Yes. Right. And when, and what you they got, call practical when, when you got your start, I know like back at one point when, when I was out in LA, things were starting to shift over that way. It was getting away from the physical, like, blood Absolutely. effects. Absolutely. You came like out that. not too long after Jurassic Park. Oh, that was the big changing? Jurassic Park changed everything. Mm. Jurassic Park was like the invention of, like, the first time film got color or sound. Mm. It, it was, it was uh, the biggest change in cinema that I've seen in my lifetime. Mm. I mean, it, it, everything changed. Overnight, I mean, it was like because there were there were bam. but there were physical things. In there, there were physical things, but let's be honest: the thing that really made Jurassic Park special were these full motion dinosaurs, as they called them. I mean, yeah, the animatronics were amazing, but not like that. Like, I mean, when that the Tyrannosaurus Rex tears, a friend of mine who worked in the film saw it and. The T Rex rips, tears through a gate Mm -hmm. in its paddock, a fence. And it went, Oh, there's our animatronic. There's our, uh, there's our big, oh, Mm -hmm. you know. And just as he was sure he was watching the animatronic, it stepped out. Wow. Complete body. And he was like, Oh my God, they did that with the computer. What the fuck? You know? Right. And it was such an obvious, mind blowing impact to the special effects world that when the Academy Award envelope was delivered for best visual effects, a big dinosaur head came out and gave it to the fucking presenter. <laughs> like, are you telegraphing much there, Academy? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and the winner is, oh, look, it's, you know, mm-hmm. not for that. <laughs> Obviously, it was Jurassic Park. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, it, yeah, it was it was like a huge big deal culturally mm-hmm. it didn't mean what star wars did mm-hmm. but as far as special effects and what i specifically do it i just, <sighs> what does the phone stop ringing for a little pe- you have to do you have to reinvent yourself at that point or well there was a lot of concern initially what's interesting is here's what happened there's a tremendous amount of concern initially but I knew, 
that they would still need animatronic stuff as go betweens. Mm-hmm. And they did for a time. And then they stopped, and everything was CG for a while. And it looked really, really bad. We had quite a few years in there, maybe 10 years, of just absolute garbage, you know, like the stuff for Van Helsing. It just, this mm-hmm. liquidy mm-hmm. movement. And that movie, Anaconda, where the snake's like running, and it's just fucking embarrassing. You know, everyone knew, okay, this sucks. This looks really fake, and it doesn't add anything to the movie. And now, post CG only cycle, it seems as if we're coming back around to filmmakers and their and filmmakers who grew up seeing practical stuff. We're coming around back to filmmakers who want to see a lot of practical stuff, mm-hmm. including J.J. Abrams. Um, so, you know, there was a well mix of mm-hmm. digital and practical effects in the new Star Wars film. But I think that the most effective use is a combination of the two. The only way you really fool an audience, because practical effects, as great as they are, st- there's still a lot of stuff that, that, that you know, they just can't do. Mm-hmm. We cannot make a dinosaur that walks across the room. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you integrate the two, like in Blade Two, when you see this, these vampire monsters' faces open, mm-hmm. and there's this tongue and all these teeth and all, you know, but they use the real actor's face and then a mechanical lower part and blend the two. Mm-hmm. You know that that's pretty amazing. You know that mm-hmm. stuff looks really really good. So, you know, hopefully. Um, you know, we'll see more and more of that marriage because that is really the whole idea of a special effect or a makeup is to convince the audience that what they're seeing is real. Mm-hmm. CG alone and oftentimes practical effects alone can't do that. Now, there are examples of both mm-hmm. that have worked spectacularly. Jurassic Park's Dinosaurs for the most part, the CG ones mm-hmm. were pretty goddamn real. Mm-hmm. Okay. But an American World from London's transformation scene wouldn't be helped a whit by mm-hmm. any d- CG technology. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, th- there, there are certainly arguments for both. And to me, the answer is the marriage of the two. Well, all right. So, I, I mean, you, I know, like, if anybody that pays attention to Jordan's blogs, his podcasts, whatever, um, it's not just the films, but the literature things. I mean, you you're quite an aficionado of horror and, and yes. fantasy stories. Um, I mean, I don't necessarily want to go into the psychology of why people like to be scared, but it's but, been covered enough. I think. But yeah. why? I mean, what scares you? Do you still have nightmares? I mean, do you still go back to the earliest films? I mean, what you know? Does... Well, nothing nothing scares me except the scariest thing I can imagine. It's a little too dark to talk about, but I mean, just just being in a horrible accident mm-hmm. and and seeing a loved one dead. I, I don't think there's anything that could possibly be worse than that. There's mm-hmm. nothing that could be worse. Mm-hmm. That's the kind of thing I have a nightmare about. I don't. I'm not. Na- I'm not afraid of monsters or creatures that eat the city or aliens coming down or anything like that because mm-hmm. that's that's kid stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and 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 and. and Monsters and, you know, I, I don't know if we've ever actually discussed this, Michael. It's interesting. But mm-hmm. monsters and demons and, in my opinion, even the Bible and all this stuff, these are symbols mm-hmm. of the good and the evil that that humans are capable of. Mm-hmm. Superheroes are supposed to be us at our very best, mm-hmm. caring for other people a- ahead of ourselves, rescuing people, mm-hmm. warning others of danger, you know, protecting and and shielding children from from evil and monsters are the Osama bin Ladens and the the Hitlers and the Donald Trumps and anyway mm-hmm. um it's 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 the evil that that people are afraid of you know personified and what that evil is is capable of doing and, and mutilation and death and mm-hmm. and suffering and pain and 
cancer and heart disease, you know, diabetes, all these awful things we're afraid of. Mm -hmm. You know, all that is personified illness. It's all personified in the monster, Mm -hmm. you know. And so all these things to me are allegories. And I've gotten past the allegorical in 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 terms of my subconscious um and and the things i fear in waking life and in 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 dreams and nightmares um are all things that are very real i have this recurring nightmare whoa this is getting deep mm-hmm. i have this recurring nightmare of not being involved in an accident or seeing someone i love dead but a woman who's just screaming and screaming because her boyfriend has been crushed in some accident. Mm -hmm. And I'm like trying not to look. I'm so scared to see what's happened. Mm -hmm. That to me, there's something tremendously frightening about that, you know? And I've heard friends of mine, especially in LA LA where Mm -hmm. traffic is just fucking crazy and people are always doing dumb things. Mm -hmm. I've almost gotten killed a few times myself by morons out there. But, in fact, some bitch from New Jersey practically killed me today. But um, it, what was I saying exactly? Well, I mean, what scares you? Well, I, 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 so, so, oh, yeah. I've had friends describe things that have happened on the freeways to them that they've seen. And I, I just, I, I really hope that never happens to me. I hope I never see something like that. Mm-hmm. Nothing scares me more than seeing somebody killed horrible like it's just awful i just can't even wrap my mind around it Mm -hmm. and it's one of the reasons why i don't think i ever wanted kids i don't want to love anyone that much Uh -uh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if something happened to a kid of mine i'd kill myself i wouldn't i wouldn't want one to live in that world Mm -hmm. and i know what happens to people and it's just so i don't know man when you really get into the dichotomy that we live in as humans between the sunny skies and the sunsets and the beauty and the mountains and the love and the passion and the beauty and the great things and art and Mm -hmm. culture and music and, and nine 11, you know, these Mm -hmm. these two things that are so disparate. It's, it's impossible to reconcile that that's the same planet. This is the same Mm -hmm. world. Michelangelo's David Mm-hmm. And the Armenian massacre, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? The Holocaust and the Louvre, or, or the Sistine Chapel, or you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Uh, the Mona Lisa, and you know, or or, or or Michael Jackson's music, and and right, you know, well, I mean, that's murder. The, that's the yin and the yang of everything. I but, just fucking can't. I can't. But I mean, but you, in some ways, you help. Des- you help design some of our fears. I design that allegory which is a safe way of sort of facing it ahead of time. I mean, we are starting to move now into why people like to get scared. Mm-hmm. Horror films are a cathartic way for people to experience death and pain and come out okay on the other side, like a roller coaster. Mm-hmm. You take a roller coaster to feel what it would be like to fall off a really bad height and mm-hmm. then you don't die at the end. Mm-hmm. You know? Right. A luxury which the 9-11 victims didn't get. Right. You know what I mean? Or, or the and, folks in Sully, that's basically the, the entire exercise of a movie like Sully. Is Sully? To, the, the Tom know. Hanks movie. But he, like, uh, uh, I didn't see that. Didn't okay. See oh, that. yeah. Well, basically. Is this the, about the, the pirates? No, the, this is the, the guy who landed on the Hudson River. Oh, that new movie. So, is. Is it, did you see that? Yeah, yeah. They, they, what they do, they is keep. Is it good? Um, for the effects, but it's the exercise of showing, okay, this guy is really a hero because he saved these people, but they they recreate what would have happened if he if he didn't make that split second decision to land on the water. So you see planes crashing into buildings and, and you know, it's in our DNA now. We're imprinted with nine eleven. So seeing that image it's like, wow. So here's so basically it's an exercise of yes, we survive. We get to see this, and we get to celebrate this man. I mean, that's 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 the, the encoding, and you know, it's it's decent. I like Flight better. If if, if, if I'm giving you a review, is that the Denzel Washington? The Denzel. Film? I Washington. thought that was incredible. Yeah. So I, but it was one of his best performances. I love Denzel Washington. Mm-hmm. Oh my God, what yeah. a performance! But yeah, it's the same. Yeah, we. we I'm drunk now. <laughs> it was so fucking great. Go see Flight. But that guy is. Just, 
but yeah, I mean, so so yeah, it's um, so des- design like the allegory as escaping death, giving giving us uh, allowing us to confront our fears in sort of a, a safe environment. But then, as we're talking about the technology is in, improving, at what point does it just get to be too real? I mean, like a lot of people back in the '30s, people were scared of Frankenstein and Dracula. No, people threw up in the theater when they saw Frankenstein's face for the first time. Mm. Threw up. In the theater. I don't think there's anything you could put on the theater screens now that would make people throw up. Mm-hmm. I mean, with the exception of some things, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, like eating baby doo-doo on screen for real or something. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But, but yeah, I mean, yeah, we have become very inured to violence. And, and, and you know, um, I have a feeling that, that um, televising the Vietnam War had a lot to do with um, desensitizing people, mm-hmm. you know, that might be one of the first points at which people really got to experience the shock of real violence. It was the first televised war, you mm-hmm. know, and um, I have a feeling that that really shook the nation. Right, there's a documentary that deals with the horror films that were made in the '70s, and it sort of connects them to as a reaction to Vietnam, like things that John Carpenter was doing and yeah. different things, you know, so I don't, uh, do you remember the name of the film? Or? I don't, I don't, but, um, it's very interesting. I mean, the, the history of film in general is fascinating as a reflection of society and what was going on in it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Godzilla is such an obvious, Japanese reaction to the the atom yeah, bomb being dropped yeah, on them. Nuclear threat. And and um you know invasion of the body snatchers is such an obvious allegory for the red scare mm-hmm. and McCarthyism. Um interestingly one of the actors in his last name was McCarthy. Mm-hmm. Um and uh you know Twilight Zone was a socially conscious show with the allegory of sort of fantasy and weird, mm-hmm. um, you know, there was a lot of stuff in there about racism and a lot of stuff in about classism and, mm-hmm. and superficiality and, and all kinds of stuff. Rod Serling was really an amazing talent. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's, and, 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 and I guess one of the things that bugs me about cinema nowadays is very little of it is reflective of what's really going on in the mass consciousness right now. Mm-hmm. Garbage like, I mean, do we really need to see another, you know, final destination? What, what's the other one that dumped the, the, the ghost in the house all the oh, time? Paranormal activities. Just paranormal activities. Is that what's really reflecting what's going on in the world right now? No, <laughs> no one cares mm-hmm. about that crap, mm-hmm. you know? And, and I would like to see more horror, fantasy, and science fiction that really is reflecting what's going on in the mass subconscious. And sadly, I think because people are so much less conscious socially than they used to be mm-hmm. or culturally, you know, that 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 void is reflected in in cinema. Mm-hmm. People are nowhere near as as socially conscious as they were in the 60s and the 70s. Right, but some some people are, are creeping some things in. I mean, I, I'm not a I haven't seen a lot of them, but I know Walking Dead is tremendously successful. Do you yeah, but like, what I don't I don't really feel like that has any cult. Well, oh, I mean, zombies in general are, are huge. Is that just because it's fashionable in vogue, or is it saying something about our fears? Well, I don't think so because it's just a regurgitation of what George Romero was saying back in 1968, okay. and in fact, moreover, in 1978 when he did Dawn of the Dead. Dawn of the Dead is a seminal horror film. A lot of people want to just, mm-hmm. you know, uh, uh, dismiss it as a gory, gross little movie. Mm-hmm. That movie is all about how zombified the citizens of this world are. Mm-hmm. They gravitate to the mall. The mall, yeah. The mall. And at one point, somebody says, why do they, why do they come here? Mm-hmm. And someone says, this place is important to them in their lives. Mm-hmm. Horrifying. Zom- I mean, zombies walking around a mall. We were just at a mall early today, mm-hmm. you know, and walking around buying crap we don't mm-hmm. need. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? So it's like that 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 point has already been made. Mm-hmm. At this point, a- a- as much fun 
as Walking Dead in, is and how well it's done, right. it's really just a survival tale with mm-hmm. some cool shit in it, mm-hmm. zombies and stuff. Right, and then you have, you have the mass marketing of the Marvel I mean, Marvel franchise. I mean, what? Oh, oh, let me let me okay, just let point. me just make another point though about mm-hmm. Walking Dead could be said mm-hmm. to be an allegory, a post nine eleven allegory, mm-hmm. because it it it's an end of the world scenario, mm-hmm. um, and and a, and a worst case scenario, mm-hmm. um. Which nine eleven certainly seemed like, um, and 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 so you know, it was Steven Spielberg called his remake of War of the Worlds his nine eleven film. Mm-hmm. So there are a lot of end of the world films. It's true, mm-hmm. and and that's all post nine eleven. But I don't feel like that point is punctuated anymore in, in Walking Dead. It, mm-hmm. it really is just kind of the same continuation so like, of a well, movie. yeah. I am Legend is a remake of something that's been done twice before. And... Yeah. Book, and it book, was, of, book of Eli. It was pretty terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, go see Omega Man if you really want the best. Well, I guess you're not. A, okay. Omega Man's good. I mean, it's a little black exploitation, but you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can go back and revisit some of these things, and they're very relevant. Like I, I just watched uh, Conquest for the Planet of the Apes, mm-hmm. and I said, "Wow, you know, this, we had Don. Very good we film. talked to Don Murray um, on one of the podcasts, uh-huh. and he was the star of that. And it's like, you know, the, yeah. There's there. I think. Yeah, I mean that's the crime, you know that that um, you could sneak as the allegory. You could sneak certain things in science fiction and horror movies that maybe you couldn't necessarily dramatize. And I mean, the Purge thing. is a very interesting series. It's not necessarily done as skillfully as it should be, mm-hmm. but the Purge is a fascinating point mm-hmm. to make that this world this this country in particular is a pressure cooker mm-hmm. and what if hypothetically there was some way to vent that for one night mm-hmm. one night a year you get to do whatever you want mm-hmm. no police no paramedics right. no social services of any kind or, or, or mm-hmm. city services um you know that's what do you call it? No civic services. Mm-hmm. Um, that is a fascinating idea. It's just mm-hmm. rather unskillfully handled, I think, in those films. But right. I, I mean, it's simplistic. Well, if, if you're talking about those kind of allegories, the movie that probably I connected with most, and this is going back probably 15 years now, was um, the Korean film Battle Royale. Oh, what a great movie. Yeah. What a great film. I mean, I think, like, it was basically remade as Hunger Games, and they're making a ton of money off that. I mean, to me, when I see hang- Hunger Games, I'm like, you, you owe this guy a check. Yeah, that's but, true. But the first Battle Royale, just what I really appreciate, and it's out forever, was the way they solve the problem. Like, they give all these kids weapons, um, and they're set out to kill one another. But the way they resolve the story says more to me about humanity than anything that American films or making American films tend to be about vengeance and retaliation. And what I liked about the Korean films and the Asian films of the nineties was that you, you saw a triumvirate. You would see people band together to save themselves. And and that's something that I, it's always one victor in an American film. It seems like, well, I mean, in general, you know, the United States in, in terms of it's the state of film, it's pretty sad. Mm-hmm. I mean, imagination is completely, Depleted. There, there's no imagination. Mm-hmm. There's a remake or a sequel, or whatever, mm-hmm. and that's about it. That's as far as they're going to go, unless it's based on a wildly successful blah mm-hmm. that already came out, and they think they've got a built-in audience. And even then, they're squeamish about taking chances because of things like, you know, uh, Princess of Mars or whatever the hell that movie was. Mm-hmm. You know, so you know. I, the only the only real um the only real solution is for people to be out there making films and i really 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 would like to see more black film mm-hmm. but 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 it's more to me than just watching and and here's this will be mm, yeah well, uh, this is what we intended in, to talk about yeah but but 
I want to see more than just films about slavery. I want to see more than just films about general racism. Um, the, 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 um, uh, you know, the imbalance that we have in this country, Mm -hmm. which is certainly there, but I want to see more imagination coming from black filmmakers, because I'll tell you what, there is an unbelievably vast untapped resource Mm -hmm. in the imagination of black people. Mm -hmm. And some of the most astounding artists I know Mm -hmm. are black folks in the business. Um, my friend Steve Olds, who's a genius. Right. Mark Page, genius. Mm-hmm. You know, um, uh, uh, well, my friend Colin is a oh. genius. You know, oh. there are so many of these artists that are just one of the most brilliant artists I've ever known was a guy named Kenny Marania. Mm-hmm. I knew him in uh, L- in in uh, uh, middle school. Well, this this is where we get to argue. All right. So yeah, that's what I'm all about. You know, my my whole thing. But for me personally, I mean, I, I know a lot of people out there, they, they don't like the idea of black film as genre um, because what happens when it's commodified is um, it's sort of rubber stamped the way the, the films are marketed and they don't necessarily reach the audiences that they're intended. Like Gina prince Bythewood um, went out when she did Beyond the Lights. I don't know if you saw that one. Great, great love story. Very, you know, it's a sort of like a bodyguard <clears throat> thing, but very refreshing because we don't always get a chance to see um, two black characters in love. Usually, if it's a black person, they pair them up with a Latina or it's something. It's just something we don't necessarily get to see a reflection of ourselves going through a romantic relationship. And it was a beautiful film. It just didn't reach its audience in theaters the way it was supposed to. And she, and then she, when it came on Netflix, she felt like it was only being marketed to the people that had black movies in their queue. And they said, well, why is this listed here? But it should be in romance and drama. We want, the intention was for everybody to experience this. And, and I guess what you're, you know, that's to, exactly what I was saying earlier. Yeah. Well, I think, well, we'll speak to that. I mean, I, I don't disagree with it, but I'll, um, but my, my point is, um, well, make, I mean, make make your point in terms of well, why it's important that I mean, everybody I, be exposed to these images. Well, how a how else are you going to spread the word about the unfairness, the imbalance, and the discrimination and the racism mm. if only black people are aware of it? Everyone must be aware of it. Mm-hmm. You know, not only on top of that. I mean, that's just logic. Number two, for racism to end. The black experience needs to be woven into the very fabric of this country because it is part of it, mm-hmm. and I mean it already is woven in. Well, yeah, that's but what it I was is not. Say. It's, it's it, definitely it is, woven in. Well, uh, you know what I mean. It, yeah. it needs to be exposed in a way that is um, in a in a way that doesn't make it strictly. For the very audience that 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 you know is making it in a way, mm-hmm. you know, every I'm not saying it has to be palatable for whites. It, it it can't be, you know, but it has to be mainstreamed. And when you when your target audience and and your deliberate target audience is blacks, that's preaching to the choir. We know about what happened in slavery. We know about what happened in the 60s. We know about the pervasive racism that goes on every day. Mm-hmm. That needs to be shared with the world. Mm-hmm. Because only then do we really raise consciousness. If you're just telling black people, you know this happened, and it's like, Wow, that's interesting. Well, it I, doesn't really. But I, I think that's move the, the machine. I think that's the machine. I mean, clearly, all right. So, yeah, there's way too many slave movies. I mean, I think the reason and audiences are not supporting it in the way that you expect. I mean, when when these movies come out, most most of the time, and I won't name names. I mean, we know like the slavery movies, the civil rights movies. Black people seem allergic to it because we don't necessarily need to experience that pain again. You know. Um, 
you know, it's it's the Tyler Perry movie or the the Kevin Hart movie that gets to a hundred million. It's straight out of Compton that gets to a hundred million. You know, but but some of these movies, it's a struggle unless they get an Oscar nomination for them to to get to blockbuster status. Well, okay. I mean, it's straight a, out of Compton though, more than Selma or more than Twelve Years a Slave or any of these other films. Straight out of Compton is a success story. Mm -hmm. You know, who doesn't like that? Who doesn't like a rags to riches story? You know, this this movie starts with homies in the hood and Mm -hmm. ends not on screen necessarily, but ends with what we now all know is the first billionaire rapper. Billionaire. Mm-hmm. It's more money than you and I and our entire families all put together will ever see in a lifetime. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, yeah, it, I mean, it, it, it of hit, course, it hit that, on all and not, not only that, but I mean, there's already such a huge fan base, right. black and white, for where that story begins. You know, NWA and the Chronic, Chronic 2000, and mm-hmm. then Snoop and all this shit. Yeah, and there were you huge know. successes in music, so they had huge white fan base. So I don't know if that's built in. quite. They had a, a huge black fan base built in. I don't know if that's and then quite. There's a nostalgia factor. Young people are discovering them. So, but I, a lot what of I'm saying, over. what I'm saying is, I don't think that that is necessarily. To me, that's not a good example of black cinema, because well, it's a black director, black stars, yes, yes, white yes. writers, but but it is a mainstream film in the very first place because the people who were fans of that music were all across the board. They're Asians and right. blacks and whites and all kinds of people who dug that thing. Well, okay. well, now now you're really segregating. I mean, I think it is a black film. On, I'm, how on am I segregating? The, well, I'm like, so uh, black movies not, have to be about oppression always? No, but what I'm saying is that film is, first of all, somewhat whitewashed, as we know. Definitely, yeah. No, I mean, no pun intended, but it... It, so it is made palatable for for audiences, probably mm-hmm. particularly white audiences. Mm-hmm. But it's not that the movie has to be about oppression, mm-hmm. but it is not the kind of black film you're talking about, mm-hmm. which is the consciousness films, the films about social struggle. It is about the rise of a group from total obscurity to indescribable fame. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, you know, a film like that is going to have mass appeal. Let's 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 let's, let's answer your question with another question. Then. then why does that film have mass appeal, and Selma doesn't? I think um, it's more commercial, clearly, because it has the music. That's exactly it what has I'm going to say. Has the, it has the music element. It's a commercial. Entity and it these has other action. films are not commercial entities. Twelve Years a Slave is not a commercial entity. No, there's no soundtrack that people are going to go run out to see so they can bang it in their cars. Mm-hmm. It's it's about something that is intensely personal and really horrific and um, heavy. Right. So I mean, but let's. I let's, mean, what, what, let's... Kind of, what kind of black films do you want to see more of? Well, no, I think I think where where I wanted to say is that um, in terms of on it's the reason why it's important. Like I, I agree with you. Ultimately, um, film should be film, and good film should be appreciated by everyone. You know, um, but but I also look at it the other side of the coin in terms of like how much over the past hundred fifty years, film has been hundred hundred fifty years. Film and media have been used to distort the perception of people of color around the world, and even worse, within ourselves. And then I, I look at like we were talking. We spent the first half of the conversation just talking about our childhood, where I mean, we weren't necessarily even thinking conscious of race on, on a on a serious level or how how it affects us. We were just kids being kids. I, I would say mm-hmm. right. We weren't thinking yeah. about that, and we liked what we liked, you know. But but then I look back and I say. As much as I identified with John Hughes and Sixteen Candles, you did. I loved those movies in high school. You know, there were there was no representation of me in that story. Me neither. And I really, initially, 
really strongly resented the breakfast club because I felt we were being asked to feel sorry for wealthy white kids. Mm. But ultimately, what that film is saying, despite it being Mm. all white, is the fact that even these kids that you see as having privilege Mm -hmm. are going through horrors of their own. Right. You know? But... I didn't really identify with it. It was, it was, it was, um, it felt a little precious to me. It always has. And it, and it, and it felt, um, and I know it's John Hughes telling his story and his, his life path, but it, it never resonated with me. It's an entertaining film. Well, I'm I'm just saying I, I came of age the same time those movies were, right? So when I was 12, 13, 14, um, the, the teen movies were, in order, my bodyguard. Porky. My bodyguard resonated with me because it was about bullying, and I was bullied a lot. Right, Porky's. But but, um, if John, all the John Hughes cycle, all those movies existed, and they were they projected sort of a white thing. And even like when when we we were younger, like watching television, you come home and you watch the Brady Bunch and it's like, okay, well, where do you see yourself? And you have to filter your identity through these characters that are not necessarily your reality. And then when you start to see people that look like you, it's Good Times or Sanford and Son. And that's entertaining, but it distorts you. So part well, of, part but, of the but, battle is to, but I mean, how do we make movies or create work that helps other people understand themselves? But let, 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 let's think about the reality of this. I, I understand what you're saying. Mm-hmm. That that um, you know, even different strokes was about you know the 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 um, the great white hope coming along and rescuing mm-hmm. two down and out motherfuckers, you know. And, and yeah, and that that you know, for somebody who didn't know their dad, that was that was fucked up. But you know, um, what's happening mm-hmm. was about was not about poor black folks. It was mm-hmm. about kind of middle classy mm-hmm. you know there wasn't a dad involved which is shitty mm-hmm. but it, it was not about poor black folks in the ghetto like good times no you know um or sanford and son who literally ran a garbage dump or something mm-hmm. so you know the thing is for me personally i've always had i mean i identify with blacks mm-hmm. and i identify with whites mm-hmm. Because and at the same time, I felt ousted by either one of them at any given time in my life, mm-hmm. because I don't fully fit in mm-hmm. with blacks. I can't be like, "Yo, nigga, what's up?" They'll be like, "What did you say?" You know, it's like, mm-hmm. "Oh, oops," mm-hmm. you know. But I also am I, 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 you know, I also don't feel like I fully fit. I certainly don't fit in with wealthy white folks. Mm-hmm. You know, and their their attitudes and their uh, the way they treat people. Mm-hmm. Um, and so so. You know, I don't know, I've, I've always there's always been a strange dichotomy in my life and, and I've never seen a show mm-hmm. that I identified with where I went. That's me. I've never seen a film. Mm-hmm. I've never seen. There, no one has ever made a film about a mulatto kid and how difficult it is to straddle both worlds. Mm-hmm. It's always black or white. Mm-hmm. That's it. Mm-hmm. Or black and white and all the difficulties they have. I think what I'm trying to say in many ways is I would like to see films where blacks are in it and it's nothing. It doesn't mean anything. Mm-hmm. They're black because they, they happen to be black. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, I mean, it's not, well, we, te- I, we, tend, we tend to be picky. I mean, like there's a movie... Dope. I don't know if you saw that one. Um, we saw it that... together. Oh, we were there. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. I, we we I, did. You took me to see it. You took me to see it, Mikey. Well, well, I mean, that was a movie I had issues with, but I mean, it was dope. Changed. Uh, well, the problem with dope to me was that it it was a very good film, very entertaining, but dope made the mistake of kind of changing courses at the 11th hour and mm-hmm. tried to become a social thing. It was, it's come on guys. It's a comedy. Don't get all heavy now mm-hmm. with him wearing a hoodie and being like, so what would you do? Nickel? It's like, come on, man, mm-hmm. get the fuck out of here. 
Mm-hmm. I don't buy that. Like, you switched gears on us and tried to make this into a social commentary, and that doesn't work. This film is fluff, mm-hmm. you know, um, of a sort, you know? Well, you know, um, well, House Party is certainly one. Then You have to go far back to get one, but... Um, I worked on one of those kid and play movies. Oh, well, oh God. What, <laughs> oh, God. Well, makeup effects on the flat top, or... No. No, uh, not House Party, but there's another one. Class Act? Class Act, yeah. Oh, God. What, what, that wasn't good? I never saw it. Um, no, it wasn't good. <laughs> I mean, I, I, like getting, I like getting played, but <laughs> no, it wasn't good. Um, well, you know, that's, 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 like, you that's, cul- like- that's cultural appropriation. I mean, they, that's when they, they whitewash it too much. And they, that's, that is a movie where it's just, um, let's, it was like a Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, but I mean, occasionally Fresh Prince of Bel-Air existed long enough that every once in a while they could in, interject some class consciousness and, and race consciousness things going on. But, but, um, well, you said something at lunch I want to get to. Okay. You said that you think black people think Key and Peele are corny. Now, are you going to edit well, this shit out? Well, no, I'm not going to edit anything. I think, I think that Key and Peele's core audience are white folks. I think most white people will go see Key and Peele more than black people do. I will make that generalization and then uncomfortably. I don't know, but I think they're funny. I think they're, they're very, they're funny. Very, very funny. I mean, if you if you want to look at the lineage, I mean, you you basically Key and Peele, that whole genre of black satirical comedians was birthed by Dave Chappelle. He was the he. Dave Chappelle was funny as fuck. He's the originator. He he was making commentary on race that both black people and white people could laugh at. Yeah. And and wasn't necessarily pointing fingers at anything. And then when he abruptly left, they they filled him in with Mencia, you know, who basically Carlos Mencia. Well, Mind of Mencia was the show that basically replaced him on Comedy Central. But that was as funny as a child molester. Yeah, well, yeah, well, he wasn't. Well, it made him hot for a minute, but it turned out he was he was defrauding people. And oh, God, this guy was so unfunny. And then you had Chocolate News. I mean, they've been trying to figure out a way to get get that in there on Comedy Central, like a black show that white people also like. And I think was that was that show. But don't you think? Don't you think that that was that even? Um, Dave Chappelle, though, was preceded by uh, Living Color? Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. But I think... Um, living co- And Living Color was really the first of those in many ways. To appeal to young people and... Well, to appeal to white and black. Mm-hmm. Across the board, everyone thought that was funny. Everybody. Mm-hmm. I actually never saw it. Mm-hmm. I've seen clips with Jim Carrey and all this stuff. Right. But... Uh, but Chappelle was... A, was They had a mixed cast on In Living Color... Chappelle basically he, by doing the majority of the sketches himself. I mean, he was his the true antecedent to Chappelle would be the Richard Pryor shows from the seventies that NBC did. But yeah, but I mean that's that's like digressing. But I mean, so Kim Peel. I mean, clearly there there's a niche that Comedy Central wants to get at, and I think that um, you know they want to show. I mean, and, and Kim Peel. Genius, the 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 musical thing where they did like the Black Town. I mean, occasionally they do things that are just spot on specific, but they're very non threatening black folks. I mean, and you know they're not aggressively making. Does do all blacks have to be threatening though to be funny? I'm not saying they're not funny. I'm just saying white people like them more than black people. I think, um, and I think I can safely make that generalization. You know, have you done a poll? <laughs> well, let's do one right now. If you think Key and Peel is funny, you're black. Say so on our comments. But um, but you the point you wanted to make. I don't know now. Are you just trying to call me out? All right. No, I wasn't calling you out. I was just I wanted to get to that though, and and cover that point in case you know you full of shit, y'all. Um, what's up? Well, I mean, it's, it's black is black. Ain't. Like I said, you know my my level of just self identifying. And taking on sort of the cause and mission of saying, I'm going to make a company called Real Black, you know, stems from a lot of personal experiences, you know, just right. going through, you know, the, the path I've had to navigate trying, trying to claim myself as an artist and a filmmaker has not been What's the most easy. racist thing you've ever experienced? 
I don't think it's. I mean, racist racism to me is systemic. It's sort of like it is. What what opportunities would I have gotten if the playing field was a little more level, or if there were more people that looked like me in positions of power? I, I think it would have been a much easier road to navigate. I mean, I've really had to do a lot of self apprenticeship and and sort of you know. I'm not saying you haven't experienced racism. I'm just saying. The is, there a, is there a situation you can recount where you're like, my God, this is actual racism happening right now? Um, I, I would say that generally when I was in film school, um, there was, uh, to answer your question, I don't really feel like in a creative environment I've directly experienced racism or prejudice i think you know but i can tell you you know it's more from omission it's um i can tell you that every job i've ever gotten on a movie or a tv show has been a result of somebody saying i need a black face here you know so when i worked on the cosby show um it was because they wanted interns. They, you know, Cosby specifically wanted to make sure that there were more black people and women that had opportunities to to be learn and get experience working on a professional production. That's when, great. When I worked on Beloved, it was because amazing Oprah. film. Oprah. I don't know if you knew how much I like Beloved. Mm. I think Beloved is a masterpiece. Mm. Shout out to Jonathan Dummy. You know, so, I mean, those were very privileged opportunities I had very early on to gain experience. But but um, generally, you know, my, I don't think my, you know, I don't know if I applied for many, but I don't think I got too many shots at getting, like, I didn't get calls like, hey, you know, come work here. And I know people in general that work in the industry that are my friends. Um, you know, a lot of times they're the only black technician on a film or they're the only person working there. So it definitely exists. But in terms of the creative stuff, the kind of like, if you talk about like microaggressions and things like that, you know, in film school, it'd be things like, you know, you'd write a script and, you know, everybody's trying to develop their voice and find themselves. And I, I would make characters that were black in my head, but I wouldn't necessarily put black in the script. And then they'd read it. And folks were like, no, you have to put black here. You have to tell people that these are black characters. It's like, well, eh. You know, I don't know. I mean, in my mind, it's already black. I don't need to cast it. I mean, you know, so it's more it's more when I'm making work, being in a position to fight for things more than somebody overtly saying you can't have this or you can't do that or or any kind of racial slight, you know. Um, and as I've matured through this, um, you know, I've found more value um, in my own work and, and developing my own voice. So there's certain things that I won't compromise on that maybe as a 20, 22 year old, I would have easily went for that, that would have been playing myself, you know, and, you know, I've had, you know, so, so I, I wish I would had been at an earlier age. I wish I had been more protected. I wish that people, you know, cause I mean, part of it's like, they're just people that are just far less talented, um, that were getting breaks, you know, just because there were there were other people already in positions of power that looked out for them, could identify them, uh, identify with them, and understood where they were coming from. Whereas for me, it was you know it was sort of like what we're talking about. It's always sort of a fight, like you know, uh, like it's great now that we have a, a range of choices of images of black folks. I mean, I guess we're still waiting for the mulatto story, but you know, in, in 89, 90, 91, you know, there's only a couple of black movies being made, black filmmakers being made and they kind of defined the brand, you know? So, so it's sort of like the early stages for me were like, how do you navigate? Okay, well, do, do I go with Spike? You know, I'm wearing the 40 acres hat or am I gangster? What's my reality? You know? So, so it's it's a, a thing. So, but I think the racism it doesn't necessarily have to speak itself. No one's ever called me a nigger. Not since I was nine. You know, I went down to King's Dominion. That's like the one and only time in my life somebody's actually 
fucking looked at me. That, besides a black person call me a nigger, you know, a white person actually call me a nigger. No, I don't think racism it's works. It's, a, uh, it's like six flags down there. Someone so, called you that? Yeah, it was like nine. We're trying to get on the roller coaster, and this kid, you know, he's operating the roller coaster. He's hey, you nigger, and it was the most helpless feeling in the world. But what? Yeah, the guy who was operating the roller coaster like, worked there. He was like fifteen. He just called me a nigger to my face. I was like, you know, and you feel really powerless at the time. So, so you know, I've I've experienced that, but I'm not. Jeez. But I think the racism is twenty four seven prevalent. And I think the fight is you know and and a lot of reasons yeah we're not going to fix racism from making movies or one movie is not going to change the face of racism you know i i don't expect that but what what i'm saying is in terms of making work and understanding how powerful an influence film has over the way people think about themselves and how they perceive others because a lot of people you know, a lot of people wouldn't be walking around with tattoos on their face trying to rap if it wasn't for Lil Wayne, you know, and the fact that he, he was on music videos. You know, that, that def- and Alan Iverson, that defined for a lot of people who they were, who they wanted to be, you know. So I am completely agreeing with you that black film needs to find a level of imagination that it has not has yet to express fully in film. And that's, what be- that's why Beasts of the Southern Wild is so important. Mm. That film tells a gritty story with unbelievable and unbridled imagination. Mm-hmm. That film is a masterpiece mm-hmm. and is highly underrated. Mm-hmm. Highly underrated. Well, I, I agree. I like the film. Some people had issues with just showing the poverty. It felt like it was poverty porn. That was one of the reactions. You know, you know why, you're damned why, if you do and you're damned if you don't. Why that do you, was the story. Well, it's a white guy making the film and he's showing this little girl eating dog food. Now, I'm not saying that... Has visually, that never happened? I'm not saying visually the film is off the chain and it, it borrows from a lot of things like Days of Heaven and different things. You know, clearly the guy understands his craft and, and you know, sort of like what Chris Rock was saying in the, the his first Oscars monologue. He's like... You know, black films need to express a greater sense of imagination. Right now, you know, if you go see a black movie and it's called Barbershop, guess what? It's in the barbershop. If it's called Car Wash, it's at the Car Wash. You know, where where is where is the black movie version of Aqua Boogie? You know, and and you know, to a certain extent, it's on us because we don't support shit. And then you know, I I'm not gonna expect somebody to walk into Paramount and say, hey, give me fifty million dollars, make Aqua Boogie. But there's enough black people that have money that go watch movies that if if people just want to support it, you you wouldn't necessarily have to rely on a white audience to to create a self suf, self sufficient network of um of support. That's that's all I'm saying. Well, should white directors be banned from directing black stories? I think they need to approach it with a level of empathy, but no, I mean, some. You don't of the, think *Beasts of the Southern Wild* was approached with incredible empathy? I'm not dis. I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm saying some of the better films this year that have black cast or black subject matter have been made by black folks. I mean, one one of my favorite movies this year Wait, is black the, or white folks. By white folks, I'm sorry. Did I say mistake? Yeah. So one of my favorite movies this year, independent, was *The Fits*, and this was sort of a cross-pollinization of um, this young white filmmaker who got a grant. She wanted to make a movie about dance, and she identified a dance troupe in Ohio, and she said, I want to make them the stars. But then she spent a month with them helping to develop the story and the characters, and what comes out of it is a beautiful cross-pollinization of what her vision was with their real life experience it's a, it's a beautiful film and i'm not saying that you know we we need to separate race i think you know hip hop wouldn't be what it is today if it weren't for the fact that um you had def jam where russell simmons and rick rubin were collaborating with artists like i i don't think hip hop would be some of the best hip hop of of like 84 85 was produced by rick rubin white guy he was taking black artists and melding it with sort of like a white, his white middle-class suburbia tastes and making really great music that holds up to its day. So I'm not, I'm not saying let's not do it. I'm just saying 
as far as audiences, audiences need to support images that they want to see. And there are enough black people out there that there should never be any kind of compromise in terms of how a story is told because of a, a perception that um, black movies don't sell well overseas or we need, in order to get this European financier to invest, we need to get a white character in, injected into the film. You know, I, I think that, that that hurts black film because at this point we, we're only getting one or two shots at things. You know, we, you know if, if one version of a story doesn't do well, you're not going to see that, that iteration for a while. The reason why we're seeing all these slave movies is because slave movies were doing well for a little while. I mean, the reason that you went to see Mr. Church this week is because The Help was a huge hit. You know, so somebody said, well, we can make some money. If, you know, instead of calling it the butler, we'll call it the cook. And that's, that was the original script for Mr. Church. It was called <laughs> The Cook. So, you know, Hollywood goes after money, you know, but the movies that you're talking about, like Beasts of Southern Wild was not done within the Hollywood system. The Fitz was not done within the Hollywood system. These, this is movies that were made independent. And then The Birth of a Nation was made completely independent. And then Fox Searchlight came in and was the highest bidder. None of this stuff, none of these expressions, in my opinion, would exist at all if you waited for the Hollywood system to say, oh, okay, let's make this movie and let's make sure everybody's in it. You know, even maybe Marvel might be smart. I'll give them enough credit to say, all right, well, we understand, like, you know, if you're going to be a superhero, everybody needs to be represented. And they're using the whole Justice League, the Marvel Universe to make movies, you know, because it's, but if they weren't making money, you wouldn't see Black Panther. You wouldn't see Ta-Nehisi Coates writing Black Panther comics, David Walker writing for, for Marvel, you know, but they, they know there's money there. Well, it would certainly be nice to see uh, more fresh black faces on film. I'm, I'm getting a little tired of their of Hollywood's token, you know, Zoe Saldana, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, Halle Berry, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, Denzel. You know, it's like. Okay, we'll get these. Th th these are our black folks here. This is the mm -hmm. well from which we can dip, and fuck all the rest of them. Mm -hmm. I hate that. Mm -hmm. I'm sick and tired, to be honest, of Zoe Saldana's face all over every fucking thing. Mm -hmm. And it's like there's only one black actress in the world right now, and that's her. That's it. Yeah. Well, yeah, it was bad. It's bad like, move for her to play Nina Simone, but you know, but she she was the person that could get the movie made. You know, like she she because of Avatar, she's on that list of highest grossing actors. Sam Jackson's on that. He's one of the highest grossing actors if you look at his com, his cumulative box office. So when you're in a hit like that, suddenly your name gets on a list and and everybody thinks that you're marketable. You know, so I hate Hollywood. <laughs> well, anyway, on that note, um, why don't we why don't we wrap up now? Okay. Well, um, well, I want to get your top five though because we, we you're top five. Horror fantasy movies for people. Horror fantasy films? for people that don't. Um... How about my favorite top five black films? Okay, go for it. <laughs> Gee, you got me ranting, and then you're cutting off the interview. All right. No, I'm not. What? I just I'm getting kind of tired. It's hot in here. We had to turn on the turn off the air conditioner. So it doesn't pick up on camera. Okay, so you wrap it up. All right, so all right, so all right, we haven't seen the mulatto movie, although he played in mulatto women. But where's the movie about the young, the little mulatto boy that help help this man understand himself better? But I'm I'm actually a real big fan of Baby Boy. I like that film a lot. John Singleton. I think Taraja P Henson is just delightful, and um, I, I I thought that Tyrese Gibson was great. Mm -hmm in it um god i've seen a lot of oh i like juice a lot mm -hmm. i love deep cover i would consider that a black film mm -hmm. i love that film deep cover um you know it's funny though i do feel like there is a sad amount of mediocrity, you know, and it's difficult to wade through it all 
to really discern what the best ones are. Well, and because black filmmakers have stayed so far away from, oh, Beast of the Southern Wild would certainly be one of them. Mm -hmm. um, I thought you mentioned Coming to America being a John Landis guy. No, the movie's terrible. You didn't like that? No. I love, love Coming to America. Completely unfunny to me. Um, talk about corny. Really? You like that? I like all the Eddie Murphy, John Lennon, except for Beverly Hills Cop 3. Love Trading Places. Love uh, Coming to America. Um, it's the, not, Jer the Jerry Curl juice scene. No, was it's hilarious. so stupid. I hate that. I laugh my ass off. Um, see, now, now you can see, talk shit about this guy because he didn't like Coming to America. But anyway. But, but um, there's such... The, in, in, in black cinema, I, I see so little imagination that it's, it's difficult for me to immediately think of a number of films that are, you know, ethnocentric that really get me going because there's so little in terms of, um, you know, s setting other than the urban decay or some sort of struggle back in the 1800s. It, mm -hmm. To me... That's why I encourage there to be so much more imagination. Mm -hmm. You know, tell some of these stories through allegory. You know, um, or well, better yet, well, I think I think the stories are out there. The money isn't. You you can do that in a comic book. You can do that in a then, graphic novel. Then then stop telling those stories and make imaginative cinema that gets audiences following you like Quentin Tarantino or somebody mm -hmm. and then you can start telling your more socially conscious stories and everyone will come to see it because you've got a cult following something like that I don't know no I'm, I'm just saying you know part, part of the dilemma it's not you know it's not that people lack imagination it's just who's financing the movies you know where does the money come from yeah, to do if, something like if, that if there's something well, what do you mean the same place all these imaginative films come from mm-hmm all the interstellars and all the fucking Harry Potters and all this shit. Right, but you Black people have the same imagination as white people and they can do and write anything they want. Of course. I'm not saying that. I'm saying it's easier for I mean Chris Nolan or somebody to get money. You know, he has a track record, but the argument if you go to the traditional sources of financing for film, they're going to say they said this was straight out of Compton. They didn't want to spend more than thirty million dollars to make straight out of Compton. The movie ended up grossing one hundred and twenty million dollars because their feeling was, this this is a risky bet, you know. But they'll 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 spend twenty. Uh, Netflix will give Adam Sandler one hundred and fifty million dollars to make movies for them because they feel that that's a safe bet, you know. You know so, what I would like to see. You know, it would really really make a great film. Mm -hmm. And it would be really something if someone did it to do the um, the 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 what what do you call it a bio flick mm -hmm. bio mm -hmm. what do you yeah. call it biopic yeah a biopic um, based on Richard Wright's Black Boy. Have you read that? Mm -hmm. You did? Yeah, yeah. Back in the day that. That needs to be a film. That's a fascinating story. Right. I'm saying th that, should be that every, every, everyone would agree on that. But then the argument is, well, we did Native Son back in 1985, and that made uh, $2.50. Right, because Native Son wasn't really done very well. well that's it was what, okay, but it could be made so much better. Well, you know, somebody outside a different system, is it's going to have it's going to take a different system to realize these types of things because like you said Hollywood they want sequels they don't want to take risks you know so anything no I mean I agree that there need to be more black self finance I mean I agree that there needs to be a separate system in place a black run owned syndicate but I get a little squeamish saying that because I get concerned about the further separation between black and white. And like 
my DNA, you know, I want to see people mm-hmm. integrated. And I want to see people, I mean, it sounds corny as shit. I sound like a Miss America winner. Mm-hmm. But I want to see racism come to an end. I want to see people just integrated. Race was not a thing in my household. It was not a thing. My mother and father didn't care if I had black friends, white friends, Chinese friends, Latino friends. They didn't give a shit. Mm -hmm. As long as I had friends, which I didn't. No, I'm just kidding. I did. Um, And isn't that the way it should always be? I mean, and, and, and. I don't know. I, I, no, I, I completely I, agree I'm, with I'm, you. All, all I'm saying, all I'm saying is that if you just look at the patterns, what what what's at risk is if if you trust your story. And it's, I think I think you know, hip hop has proven to me that if you tell your story truthfully, ought, there's a mass of people that will support it. You know, like you know when. When black people were given the freedom to express themselves without <clears throat> tremendous compromise, the best work was made. I mean, you go back. Well, that's the truth. That's true of any art. Right. When art is not compromised, the best work is produced. Right. But I'm saying Hollywood like, is all about compromise. Hollywood is about. Um, uh, uh, You know, uh, 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 appropriation. Mm-hmm. Hollywood is all about appropriation. Mm-hmm. If they see money anywhere, mm-hmm. if they sniff it like a shark smells blood a mile away, mm-hmm. they'll go for it and devour it. Mm-hmm. Look at the Blair Witch Project. Mm-hmm. That film was made for like what, what, twenty five hundred bucks, mm-hmm. and it made millions. Technically, it's the biggest money maker in cinema history mm-hmm. ever. Mm-hmm. Okay. As soon as Hollywood smelled that, they pounced on it and made a million found footage films, all of which sucked the rigid cock of Satan. Mm-hmm. And Hollywood took that over, appropriated it, and ruined it. Mm-hmm. They butt fucked it to death. Mm-hmm. And they do that with everything. Mm-hmm. Comic Con used to be about artists, it used to be about art, mm-hmm. visual art, sculptural art, comic art. Paintings, mm-hmm. you know, all that stuff. Hollywood smelled money there after a while. They appropriated it. Mm-hmm. And now two thirds of the whole fucking thing are taken up by Warner Brothers and Paramount and, and you know, all these D bag right. companies trying to shove the next fucking Star mm-hmm. Wars movie down your throat. And there is almost no room mm-hmm. for the really cool shit that I used to go there for. Mm-hmm. Because Hollywood smelled money, and they put their fat ass in the middle of it and fucked right. it up. Right. So all I'm saying is, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying like, um, you know, it has to be foreign language films. But I'm just saying, how cool would it be if there were enough people out there that would that were interested in seeing authentic representations of who they were, regardless of what their class or their background was. I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not here to define what blackness is to anybody, you know, cause we're all mixed, you know, but like I said, there's certain, there's certain stories that I think if Hollywood gets a hold of them, it, it gets, it gets messed up. Like, of course, you know, so, You're so I'm saying here disagreement from me about that. So I'm, I'm just saying like, okay, well, if, if a system was in place where, okay, if, if, if somebody got but, together and they, they made a movie for, Three million dollars. If there was a system in place where um, they didn't necessarily have to worry about getting it on three thousand screens, but there were enough people out there that were interested in that story that but they could that, make their three million back. To that end, though, there needs to be another system in place: black, white, green, or purple. Mm-hmm. That's just separated from Hollywood that can get distribution deals, so that people see real cinema again, and not this pablum that's being shoved down our throat with every fucking Transformers piece of fucking crap mm-hmm. they make. When I start talking about this stuff, I get really pissed off because mm-hmm. I have been dealing now with Hollywood for almost thirty years, and I've been damaged mm-hmm. by the way that system works. It enrages me. It's about as unfair as it comes. I've had my credit stolen on films from Avatar to, you know, just almost everything I've worked on. Mm -hmm. I haven't, you know, I got no credit on Men in Black. I worked on that fucking thing for almost a year. Mm -hmm. You know, bullshit. You know, my credit was completely stolen by some jackass 
and a whole bunch of people were pissed off about it because mm-hmm. he took credit of a lot of people on Avatar. Mm-hmm. You know, so it, it's like mm-hmm. I, I'm fed up with Hollywood, and I would love to see some other entity, some other enterprise come in that wants to make art. Mm-hmm. The problem is everybody, everybody, black, white, yellow, mm-hmm. doesn't matter, wants to see a return. Everybody. Mm-hmm. It always is going to come down to money. Right. You know? Right. So, so I don't know where we sit. We've never really sat down like this. Not really. Talked about not like the art. This. So, you know, we've shared it with you. And, and um, you know, but plug for your your uh, podcast again. and what, what Oh, uh, yeah. If any of you guys remotely enjoyed watching my fat ass talk about nothing, uh, you can experience an hour of it a week uh, on my podcast, Freelance Horseshit, um, which is on my website, uh, jordushell.com. That's J-O-R-D-U-S-C-H-E-L-L dot com. Go under blog. You'll see him there. I also do horror story readings from some of my favorite horror authors. You can check those out if you like horror. Um, but uh, well, hopefully it was I'm not black enough for black people. I'm not white enough for white people. It's a great way to live. <laughs> the reason why Donald Trump is where he's at, if we relate it to film, I think there's some films pe- people need to see that point to the danger of why Donald Trump is so important with his cult of personality. What makes me mad is all the gangbangers, right? Mm-hmm. All the gangbangers that are supposed to be banging and shit. Okay, the cops are killing us. Why aren't you shooting at them for us? <laughs> what, what happened, gangbangers? All of a sudden they at home and shit. <laughs> Motherfuckers are at home. We're all these tough gangbangers. We need you. Hello. Hey, man, the Italians got mafia. Like the Italians. Is, you know what I love about the, the mafia and the Italians? They protect their neighborhoods. They protect their neighborhoods. They protect their people. We're the only motherfuckers that have no mafia. Black people don't got a mafia. We, don't have, we can't even organize crime.